The Great War was over. On the 11th of November 1918, an armistice had been signed. In Britain and France, the survivors celebrated victory, the return of peace and the end of bloodshed. They'd left behind the nightmare lands of death and destruction created by four years of war. The cost of those years was almost beyond imagination, but somehow, somewhere, that cost would have to be counted. And the defeated would have to pay the price of peace. To the west of Paris stands the great palace of Versailles. It was here that the peace treaty with Germany would eventually be signed. But before that could happen, much had to be decided. In January 1919, two months after the armistice, the delegates of the victorious powers arrived in Paris for the peace conference to draw up the terms to be offered to the defeated countries. In all, the representatives of 27 nations attended that conference. But of all the statesmen who came to Paris to settle the peace, the most important were President Wilson of the United States, Georges Clemenceau, the French Premier, and Lloyd George, Prime Minister of Britain. Each had very different ideas of what to do about the central problem of Germany. Clemenceau, like most Frenchmen, knew what he wanted out of the peace. Revenge. Reparations for the damage the French had suffered and guarantees that a similar war would never, could never happen again. The idea that Germany should be let off lightly would have seemed sheer madness to Frenchmen who'd seen the effects of the German war machine on their own country. In order that scenes like this could never happen again, they wanted a Germany stripped of her wealth and armed forces. In contrast, Woodrow Wilson appeared to promise a just and lasting peace, not punishment. Europe acclaimed him as the great and good man from the New World. This was because his 14 points seemed to promise a new moral order in international affairs. No more secret diplomacy, reduction in armaments, and a League of Nations to protect all countries from aggression. He didn't want revenge as the French did, but there was no question that Germany should get off scot-free. But while Wilson was planning the future of Europe, Americans were rapidly losing interest as their boys came back home. They wanted a peace that wouldn't involve them in European affairs. Surprisingly, it was Lloyd George who fought most strongly for German interests at Versailles. Behind him was a public elated by victory but eager for revenge. The Prime Minister appeared to share their opinion, but really had no time for those who wanted to destroy Germany. What mattered to him was that Germany should be made stable and allowed to recover her strength as a trading partner. This was the kind of Germany he feared, a land of miserable refugees, poverty, homelessness and starvation. All conditions likely to provide a perfect breeding ground for the new disease from the East, communism. In Berlin, his fears had already been realized. A communist revolt had broken out there in early January. While the leaders tried to rouse the mass of the people, armed communists occupied key public buildings. This was a direct challenge to Ebert, acting president of the new German government. He had to turn for support to army generals who brought in bands of ex-soldiers and turned them loose on the communists. 
Berlin briefly became a battlefield. Within a week, the revolt was crushed. Communist leaders were rounded up and some brutally murdered. Post-war politics in Germany were off to a bloody start. Meanwhile, in Paris, whilst the German government was squashing the threat to its own existence, the Allied leaders were arguing their way over the whole future of the German people. Under their hands, the map of Europe was drawn and redrawn again. At last, after more than three months of discussion, they presented the terms of their treaty to the Germans. Germany lost land in the east, the west and the north. In the east, the most important of those losses was the wide strip of territory given to the newly independent Poland, separating East Prussia from the rest of Germany. While on the west, France took back the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine and was also given the right to mine coal in the Saar, an area placed under League of Nations control for 15 years. To protect France, Germany was forbidden to station soldiers in the Rhineland, an area which was to be occupied by Allied troops until 1935. It was not only the loss of territory which Germany resented, but also the fact that Czechoslovakia and Poland now contained large numbers of Germans. And as if to add insult to injury, the treaty forbade German-speaking Austria to unite with Germany. Her fortifications were to be destroyed. Her army was to be reduced to 100,000 men. No air force, no submarines, and to accept blame for starting the war and pay reparations. In protest at Scarpa Flow, the British naval base, the Germans scuttled their fleet rather than hand it over to the Allies. It was a last defiant gesture. Germany would have to agree to the terms. She was in no position to restart the war. So, in the high summer of 1919, the German delegates were brought to the Great Hall of Mirrors at Versailles to sign the peace treaty. It was a compromise peace that satisfied not even one single Allied leader, and predictably the Germans loathed it. <laughs> 